welcome Jacelyn Findlay with her thesis, Conserva Conservation Easements, an easy way to keep our world green. Let's give her a hand. Everyone likes Spartan Springs. Spartan Springs is known for cold blue water, polar bear plunges, and having plenty of visitors. But few who frequent Barton Springs realize that they are swimming with an endangered species. The Barton Springs salamander can grow up to about two and a half inches long and has fuzzy pink external gills on the sides of their heads, like Mexico's axolotls. The Barton Springs salamander has been on the International Union for Conservation of Nature, of Nature Red List for 22 years. The IUCN website gives justification for this listing because its population size is estimated to be less than 1,000 mature individuals, and it is known from only a single location. Since 2004, when the report was updated, little attention has been given to the Barton Springs salamander. These salamanders are only found in the Zilker Park area. Unfortunately, due to their fragile nature, they have been put at risk due to man-made pollution and removal of aquatic plants from Barton Springs pool. Barton Springs salamanders are dependent on clean water and aquatic plants to survive. Since the addition of chemicals like bleach into the water and removal of the aquatic plants, these salamanders have been dying out. The aquatic plants used to provide shelter for the salamanders. They are going extinct simply because swimmers don't like seaweed touching their toes. When we tamper with nature, we destroy our ecosystems, and we are interfering more and more with Texas's natural processes every day. Texas has one of the fastest growing populations in the country. Natural land is not being protected as it should be. We are swallowing Texas up. But we have a long ignored secret weapon. In encouraging the public to get involved in land conservation, our natural land can be preserved more effectively. This is often done through conservation easements. A conservation easement is an agreement between a private landowner and a federal, state, or local government agency or a land trust. A conservation easement protects a piece of land by placing certain building and development restrictions on it. The restrictions vary from easement to easement, but both parties usually agree that the landowner must not develop buildings on, the, on their land. The agreement is perpetual, meaning that the land will always be under a conservation easement, essentially until the end of time. Simply put, a conservation easement is a contract intended to keep a piece of natural, undeveloped land untouchable. The landowner gives up certain property rights, but still gets to own the land that they cherish. A conservation easement qualifies for a federal income tax deduction. A tax deduction reduces the amount that a taxpayer can be taxed on. For a conservation easement to qualify for a tax deduction, the land must be donated for one of four purposes. Education or recreation for the public, protection of open spaces, protection of, of historic buildings, or wildlife and biodiversity protection. Biodiversity, or biological diversity, is exactly what it sounds like, diversity of organisms in a given area. A conservation easement counts as a charitable contribution, which is why a landowner can receive a tax deduction. Farmers receive twice as much as a non-farmer with the same income for a piece of land worth the same amount. Specifically, farmers receive a tax deduction worth 100% of their income, and non-farmers receive one worth 50% of their income for 15 successive years. Farmers in this situation, that is farmers with plenty of land and a small income, are often referred to as land rich and cash poor. This is an unfortunate condition that affects many farmers. It often happens when a farmer inherits land from their family, causing the imbalance of wealth and assets. The farmer is then left with the choice to either sell their land or to hang on to their heritage and continue to struggle financially. Currently, landowners receive a tax deduction, not a tax credit. All this tax terminology can get confusing, but what we have to keep in mind is that there is a distinct difference between a tax deduction and a tax credit. A tax credit is similar to a tax deduction, but it is much more clear about the savings it creates. A tax credit takes away a portion of your tax liability. For example, if you owe $20,000 in taxes and qualify for a tax credit of $1,000, you will only have to pay $19,000. Their currently uh, carry forward tax credit offer, um, allows landowners to save the unused remainder of their tax credit for a later year. There are currently many federal tax credits offered, such as the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, or the residential energy efficient property tax credit. I will argue that, that I will, um, in order to effectively preserve our country's natural land, Congress must pass a federal bill that offers landowners a one-time carry forward tax credit for those who donate their land as conservation easements. I will argue that biodiversity is imperative to protecting nat the natural resources of our world. I will argue that because they protect biodiversity, more conservation easements are necessary. And because more conservation easements are necessary, the federal government must provide landowners a tax credit that, off that um, a tax credit that offers, um, that so that, <laughs> must offer 
landowners a tax credit so that the donors may be more willing to donate their land in the first place and they may benefit more from their donation. Biodiversity is important. Biodiversity, as was just stated, is the term for diversity of or organisms on Earth. It is why we have so many different types of organisms. Humans receive many benefits from biodiversity, which we call ecosystem services. Examples of ecosystem services include pollination, removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and natural pest control. It is especially important for the impoverished population of the world, but biodiversity affects everyone. It is why we have so many different options to choose from in the produce section at the grocery store. It's why our air is clean. It's why we can stay healthy. Over 60% of all people rely mainly on plant-based medicine. We use biodiversity in nearly all of our interactions with the natural world. Biodiversity loss is the decrease of variety of species. A series of experiments led by David Hooper shows that as biodiversity loss increases, ecosystem services decrease. When less than 50% of the tested ecosystem's organisms became extinct, plants grew less frequently by almost 10% and the ecosystem was less productive. When over 50% of the ecosystem's organisms became extinct, loss drastically affected the ecosystem, with consequences such as nutrient pollution, increase in atmospheric nitrogen, and drought. In 2010, researchers found that global biodiversity loss was increasing. Other researchers estimate that if humans continue developing land at our current rate, 11% of all natural land will be lost by 2050. Dr. Mohamed Kamar with the Current Science Association states that, if, um, states that human activities are a threat to biodiversity in a number of ways, such as, um, such as habitat loss, introduction of exotic species, change in climate and biochemical cycles, Human actions can be linked to a rapid increase in the rate of species extinction and loss of biodiversity. Not only are we headed towards disaster because of biodiversity loss, but it is our own fault. We do not take our roles as stewards of the earth seriously enough. With consequences such as, new, as um, habitat loss and introduction um, and disruption of natural processes, it is all too clear that we destroy what we touch. Habitat loss happens when we develop land. Habitat loss kills the plants and animals that used to live in that community, causing biodiversity loss. We must do something to counteract this. Of course, the way to stop damaging our land through developing it is to stop developing it. Since it is impossible to naturally boost or improve biodiversity without damage restoration, it is unreasonable to expect improvement from conservation easements. However, they can effectively preserve what we have left. The most effective way to preserve what we have left is to leave our land alone. Um, and why would anyone want to form a conservation easement? In America, it's safe to say that giving up rights, especially certain property rights, is hardly viewed as a good thing. However, conservation easements protect a right more important than property rights, the right to life. Biodiversity, as was just explored, provides food and air and ecosystems. The more variety of organisms, the healthier the ecosystems. What is important to note, though, is that conservation easements protect biodiversity. Simple logic proves this theory. Organisms need a place to live. If humans settle the habitat, organisms can't live there and often die because of it. Biodiversity decreases. If humans set aside the land for organisms to live on, biodiversity can be preserved. Many studies support this point. Researchers conducted a study of bird biodiversity in New Jingwan Town in Shanghai, China. The researchers studied records from 2002 to 2013. They found that as the area was urbanized, the biodiversity of the local birds decreased by 75% the weaker birds died off and only the more resilient species survived. It is safe to infer that because the birds died off as their habitat was preserved, they died because of habitat loss. Another study shows a similar pattern. Researchers, uh, researchers transplanted yellow-tailed blue damselfish into multiple live coral reef habitats in Papua New Guinea. Over the course of 16 weeks, the researchers, uh, the researchers uh, took away portions of the coral reef so that the fish had a smaller habitat to live in. The results showed that the most diminished reef killed the most fish. Unlike the study done in New Jingwan Town, the researchers conducted the fish study in a controlled set setting and only studied one species. But both studies show a habitat that was not well taken care of, and therefore the resident native organisms suffered for it. These examples may seem irrelevant because they take place across the globe, but biodiversity loss is happening in our own backyard. 115 miles of the Texas-Mexico border is currently lined by a wall. This small section of wall has caused biodiversity loss for the resident Texas organisms that live there. Many of these organisms are endangered, such as the ocelot and the near extinct wildflower, the zapata bladder pod. Government administration has proposed to build a border wall directly in the rare biome which said organisms depend on. If this wall is built, 
uh, pollinators and other organisms will be unable to cross the border, cutting their habitat in half, causing the amount of local desert life to decrease. Not to mention the disturbance that construction causes, digging, removal of plants, loud noises and lights and humans that would drive animals away. However, there's hope. Habitat protection is one of the best ways to protect land because we set aside certain portions of land to be left alone. Hab uh, d protecting land is effective when we abstain from developing it, over farming it, or polluting it. According to the United States Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, farmers that make less than $10,000 a year on their land account for over half of all American farmers. Only 4% of farmland is owned by non-family farms. Overall, only half of all working farmland is owned by medium to large scale farms. Small farmers own the other half of all working farmland and yet they are ignored. The current policy benefits big farmers much more than it does small farmers. Because the current policy benefits, uh, benefits I'm sorry, because the current policy is based on income, if a, if a wealthy farmer donates a piece of land worth a certain amount, he will receive a larger tax deduction than a small farmer who donates a piece of land worth the same amount. This is unfair to the small farmer who re would receive a, s a lesser income deduction simply because his income is less. With an average effective tax rate of 11.5%, it is perfectly plausible for a small family farmer to need a bit of financial help. A poor farmer wouldn't need an overly generous tax deduction, the same way that you don't need a $500 coupon for a cup of coffee. This is why a tax credit is a much more reasonable tool. As a one-time credit, it would act as a reserve of money that can be drawn from once a year, every year during tax season, um, until either runs out or the carry forward period ends. The current policy, on the other hand, is far too generous for small farmers and therefore is unreasonable and unuseful. The tax credit policy would work in a similar way to the current policy. Just like the current policy, each farmer would receive whatever the government allots, but it would be according to the fair market value as determined by an expert appraiser. Using the cup of coffee analogy, it's like receiving a $500 coupon, uh, gift card that can be used again and again until the $500 is gone. If a land-rich, cash-poor farmer receives a large tax credit, they may not have to pay taxes for years. This has the potential to be a massive weight lifted off the shoulders of farmers and even off of all donors. The only fair option for small farmers and even for non-farming landowners of meager means is to offer them a fair tax credit, which will help them far more and be far more resourceful than a tax deduction ever could. But most importantly, the, um, the, the, the tax credit must be, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, each farmer would receive whatever their land merits and the rich would not be favored. In 2006, federal law stated that the landowner would receive a tax deduction worth 50% of their income for five successive years. In February of 2015, five years was increased to 15. One would think that this increased incentive would encourage more landowners to donate their land as conservation easements. And it did for one year. In comparison to the 8,000 donated acres in Texas in 2014, in 2015, Texas landowners donated over 25,600 acres as conservation easements. That is roughly equivalent to 260 times the land owned by Veritas. In 2018, only 10 Veritas's were conserved. The issue is not that Texas is running out of land to donate. Out of 16 billion acres in Texas, only 1.5 million are conserved under conservation easements. That is roughly one protected acre out of every 10,000. The 2015 spike in donations lasted for less than one year. But conservation easements last forever, so the number of conservation easements in Texas is not decreasing. It is still increasing, but by less and less each year. The number of conservation easements in Texas is beginning to plateau while our cities are expanding. Clearly, the Conservation Easement Incentive Act of 2015 only temporarily persuaded landowners to donate their land. It, simply increasing the incentive was not enough. The only way to make an impact on potential donors is to offer them something that will actually help them, a tax credit. This way, they may see that they get a, f a great compensation for their donation, get to keep their land, and get to do something good for the environment. Also, those who, uh, they may be more willing to donate if they see right away how much they get off of their taxes. Those who are not so well versed in financial parlance may see the clear cut manner of the tax credit and be more willing to donate their land as conservation easement if they see that they get thousands of dollars off of their tax credit. But most importantly, the tax credit must be near to the fair market value of their land than the current policy in order to make an impact on potential donors. 
Some may argue that acquiring an agricultural exemption would be just as helpful as creating a conservation easement. Uh, um, an agricultural exemption is a property tax exemption given on the basis of agricultural usage of land. Non, um, farmers and ranchers uh, are the only people who can apply to receive one. Non-farmers cannot apply to receive one since they do not use their land for agricultural purposes. Farmers and ranchers that can apply to receive one would specifically be beekeepers, fish farmers, timber loggers, crop dusters, and other sorts of agricultural workers. Agricult agricultural exemptions would only benefit farmers and ranchers. Also, research shows that corporate machine-based farming is damaging to biodiversity because it uses so much land. Agricultural activity does not protect biodiversity as much as habitat, as much as biodiversity, uh, does not protect biodiversity as much as habitat preservation does. Also, there's also the, um, there's also always the possibility of a farmer accidentally introducing invasive species onto the land, allowing it to choke out native plants. With a conservation easement that is intended to preserve biodiversity, there's virtually no risk of this happening because invasive species are not involved in any activities on the land. Um, besides, the, okay, besides the invasive species of the occasional hiker or picnic goer, the land is quite safe from foreign organisms. Simply leaving your land alone is also another option. It has been argued that conservation easements are unnecessary because there must be tons of untouched private land out there, not under a conservation easement, but doing the same job. This is all well and good, but the point of increasing the incentive is to encourage more landowners to donate their land as conservation easements. Getting more landowners to donate their land, uh, getting more landowners to leave their land alone without compensation may prove to be easier said than done. Of course, a landowner could always sell their land, but this invites an unfortunate consequence for the environment. Because a seller cannot force a buyer to pertain to certain rules or restrictions, the buyer always has the option to develop or pollute the land, and this would damage biodiversity. If a if a landowner decided to place a conservation easement on their land before selling, the land would sell for less because buyers would be less willing to buy the land because they could not develop on it. Selling land is either a loss for the landowner or for the environment. So someone could always um, sell their land to the government, but this brings us back to the argument. Um, but this brings us back to the argument that landowners may be unwilling to sell their land. Some feel sentimental about their land because it may have been passed down in the family for generations. While this may seem like an easier option, getting more landowners to do this may prove easier said than done. Landowners and audience, your land is important. If you like to wander down hiking trails and bird watch and garden, if you love to hunt deer or dove with your children, if you want your grandchildren or great-grandchildren to be able to see rolling hills and play in a creek, Watch the fireflies come out at night. Splash in the water with the minnows and frogs and pick wildflowers after school 30 or 40 years from now, you should seriously consider completing a conservation easement for a part of your land. Texas is losing land at a faster rate than ever. In over 15 years, Texas has lost 1.1 million acres of rural working land to, to urbanization. There's, uh, that is roughly equivalent to one and a half times the area of Hong Kong. If you'd like to get involved in uh, <coughs> If you'd like to get involved in protecting the natural resources of our state, the conservation easement process is simple and can cater specifically to your land. You can get started by contacting a local land trust, such as Texas Hill Conservancy or Hill Country Conservancy. Let's work to keep Texas natural. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a few returning judges for JC's panel. We have Stephanie Ju coming back to us. Stephanie Ju is an assistant director at the Energy Management Program at the University of Texas at Austin and is a lecturer in business law and ethics in the Macomb School of Business. She's been teaching at the university level for 10 years. She has industry experience as a legal analyst for ExxonMobil and as associate corporate counsel for the Electric Reliability, Electric Reliability Council of Texas. That's really hard to say. I think they did that on purpose. We also have returning Sonny Allen, who has over 38 years of real estate experience. He obtained his, estate his real estate license in 1981 and became a broker in 1985. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Sam Houston State University with an agriculture business major and a minor in real estate. 
Sonny has an extensive range of real estate experience, including ranch brokerage, agricultural land evaluation, commercial appraisal, and real estate finance. In 2009, Sonny founded the West Pole Partners LLC, which specializes in ranch brokerage and consulting for wildlife and agricultural related properties. We also have Kristen True, her advisor. <coughs> She's been at Veritas for 12 years, and she loves how teaching science lends itself to teaching about God as creator and viewing things through a biblical worldview. She's also going through the process of a conservation easement right now, so she has some real-time experience with what, she, what JC's talking about. We also have Graham Donaldson, who relentlessly buys land and then gives it away to easements and just can't seem to understand that if you want to build a house, you can't give away the land. So. <laughs> Right. It, you have paddles, you all know what's going on with the paddles, so the floor is open. Hi, JC. Great job. I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, so you talk about um, so giving this land in the conservation easement, can people, are people still able to use their land after it's under conservation easement to help make their income? Um, you mentioned something about machine-based farming damaging the land, so how does that fit in with if you can still use that land or not? Um, yeah, they, they can still do that. They call that an agricultural land easement. And I think um, specifically with the federal government, they um, that can happen through the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, under their ACEP program. Um, and the <laughs> um, I believe that they can, um, it, it varies from easement to easement, um, but I believe that um, most farmers can still farm on their land, um, but the degree to which that can happen depends, so. Just to follow up with that, first of all, uh, great job, JC. So if I had a conservation easement, is there something that I have to do on the land to uh, uh, keep it pristine, or is it just I'm supposed to not do anything? Um, usually it's just you have to refrain from building on your land. I don't think you have to um, do any damage restoration, um, y yeah. So then, is there any incentive, f if I have donated my land for conservation easement, to do things to in improve biodiversity, whether that's, uh, you know, um, bring back native Texas grasses or do any kinds of, of restoration projects? Do I, uh, does that um, improve my deal, or is there any um, anything in in the in the um, the tax credit where I can either get a sweeter deal, I can extend it? Has your research sort of looked into that? That if, I, that if I improve my land mm -hmm. for the reasons why you would have a conservation easement, that it's a better deal for me. Um, I have seen um, arguments around that uh, landowners should start uh, improving biodiversity with their conservation easements, but I don't think that's required. Um, I, I do think that you could probably work something out uh, like that with um, perhaps a land trust or um, the federal government, whoever you're using the doing a conservation easement through. But... Um, I don't think that there's, um, I actually don't know if there's um, something that can give you a better deal if you improve biodiversity. Yeah. So you mentioned um, biodiversity and kind of the, the endangered species and, and, you know, if this is a big enough problem, can we just rely on people to do this voluntarily or does it need to become a compulsory uh, type of thing where the government's coming in saying you're going to have a conservation easement, no questions asked. What do you think? Um, I do think that honestly it would be easier to um, just wait for people to do it voluntarily by making the incentive more appealing. Um, however, um, I think that in the future if that's something that the government would be interested in, um, I mean that goes a little bit more into eminent domain, uh, but I do think that, um, yeah, that would be definitely something that they could look into. Sonny, sorry there. First of all, thank you for picking this topic. Um, I, one of the biggest arguments that I hear against conversation, con conservation easements <coughs> is that you're simply rewarding wealthy people who own land um, with an incentive that they don't really financially need. Now, you address the smaller family farm, and thank you for doing so. <laughs> but uh, prevalently in this region, we see ranch land uh, put into conservation 
and it's typically, um, you know, nicer, pristine ranches that go into these easements, and, and, and often they are owned by uh, high net worth individuals. And so the argument comes up, we're just rewarding, you know, the rich people with an additional tax break that they don't really deserve. Can you address that for me? Yeah, um, so that reminds me of, um, I read something on um, President Trump, I think before he became president, um, placed a conservation easement on his golf course. Um, and <laughs> while <laughs> um, I would say that, honestly, that would, be hap that would have to be up to um, uh, the land trust or the government that you're working with. Um, I honestly, I don't think that it's fair um, to take land that's not really helpful to biodiversity and then pretend that it is. Um, but I, yeah, I would say that um, appraisers and um, the government and land trust should use more discretion when they're dealing with certain cases like that. Um, I do know that they, um, most people have a list of priorities that they look for. Um, and some of them can be like, is there buffer land around the um, acreage that needs to be donated? Um, or perhaps it's like, does it benefit biodiversity? Stuff like that. Um, so I think that um, definitely um, that should be the priority rather than, I don't know, gaining, gaining brownie points with <laughs> wealthy. But And a follow-up to that, um, did you look into how many... What is the ideal acreage amount for that? Because that could also affect, um, you know, if I only have 10 acres and I'm willing to go under a conservation easement and I'm right on a river, what does that look like versus if I have 500 acres and is there an amount? <coughs> yeah, um, so with the federal government, I didn't see a minimum acreage amount, um, but with state programs and with land trusts, there are, and they can vary anywhere from 10 to 50. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, um, yeah, as a minimum, yeah, so 10 acres to 50 acres would be the min minimum for state and land, uh, land trusts. So you can just walk me through, you made a passing reference in your speech that when the land gets sold, that the conservation easement is now potentially dissolved? Is that, did I hear that correctly? No, the conservation easements are forever, so if you put a conservation easement on your land and you sell your land, then it'll still be there. Is there any, and there are, are there any clauses where that gets removed, or it's in is it like a hundred year, or is it in complete perpetuity? I believe it's forever, forever. Um, that's one of the um, that's one of the requirements for making conservation easement that it has to be perpetual. And so then, the percentage of land that's under conservation easement. Do you know the ratio between the percentage of land in Texas under conservation easement versus the amount of land that's not under conservation easement, but is completely, is undeveloped and untouched and pristine. I actually don't know that. But yeah, I'd be happy to look it up for you. <laughs> Stephanie. This is a follow up to um, Graham's previous question. Um, so if, if this conservation easement is sort of a, like a, I guess a hybrid contract deed uh, sort of situation between the landowner and a government entity, it seems like even though it, it's supposedly in perpetuity, it seems like the government at some point could say, well, you know, we don't really need this anymore. Oh, we want to develop the city, mm -hmm. you know, out into this um, conservation easement. Is, is there, did you find anything where that's happened or where you could predict that, okay, you know, Austin is growing really big, mm -hmm. or you know, just pick another city that's growing really big that could be pushing up next to these conservation easements that would sort of make the government entity say, "Well, let's just get rid of this." Can can they undo it? I mean, is there a good reason for them to undo it? Um, are you asking for my opinion? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, personally, I think that when the government makes a promise, they should hold to it. Um, <laughs> and so I, yeah, I definitely, um, this, <laughs> this is coming from the heart. I personally really love open spaces. There's a flower field right in my neighborhood, right next to my house. And, um, that's one of my favorite places to be. And so I think that, um, if the government says, Hey, we're going to, uh, you can make a promise with us that you're not going to touch this land. Um, and then they say, Hey, wait, we're going to develop on this. I, yeah, I personally think that um, that 
shouldn't, um, they shouldn't do that. Um, however, I think that because the government, um, the government's the government, so I think that um, that's <laughs> definitely a possibility. I think they probably could do that. But. Just to follow up with that, let's say that your proposal becomes really popular and everybody is donating their land to conservation easements. Is there, is there no argument for some kind of out clause for unforeseen circumstances? Let's say they find diamonds in dripping springs and everyone's moving there and uh, they, need to, they need to develop the city. Like, um, um, are you having a hard line in saying that once the conservation easement is in place, the no wiggle room? Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I do know that in, this is, um, well, I do know that in Texas they have um, mineral rights land, um, and that's mostly in Big, bed, big Bend country, um, where Texas owns um, the mineral rights, rights to the land, but private landowners own the soil. Um, but I think that in the case of um, under conservation easement, Oh, that's a hard question. I, <laughs> um, I honestly would say that they should stick to it. Sonny? What about circumstances where the easement uh, grantee is not a public entity or, or not a government entity? Like the, if it's a land trust that's being granted the easement, uh, wouldn't they be able to go back and renegotiate that if the current landowner and the land trust is willing to abandon the easement or modify the easement if they're in agreement to do so, wouldn't they be able to do that? Um, I actually didn't research a lot about land trusts um, for my thesis, and that's simply because um, land trusts are really hard to regulate because they're separate nonprofit organizations. Um, but, um, I th yeah, I honestly don't know, but, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I could find that out for you. Um, can you speak a little bit more about to the wall? You had a little thing about the wall in there and pollination <laughs> efforts and um, how it's decreased biodiversity there and concerning, you know, moving forward with, with that. And you mentioned like pollinators, for example, and um, that's one of those things like some pollinators fly. So exa <laughs> exactly what do you see happening there? Yeah, um, so there are currently, I believe, um, eight proposed designs for the border wall. Um, and some of them look like fences, and some of them look uh, like a mixture of wall and a fence, and some of them are complete concrete walls. Um, and I think um, most pollinators is, um, are flying. <laughs> um, and um, down in, in the desert area um, where the wall is going to be built, which is, um, I believe it's called something like the Tamulipin uh, thorn scrub or something like that, um, there are not a lot of... Um, creatures down there just because they're dying out. Um, but the pollinators in Texas, I have a list here. Um, there's things like bats and bees and hummingbirds, um, butterflies and moths and wasps and flies and beetles. Um, and so most of those fly, but a lot, of, um, a lot of pollinators are ground creatures that can rub up against bushes and plants and stuff and carry pollen on their fur. Um, and those would be unable to cross the border. Um, and as for the little flying creatures, um, I would say that even though they probably could fit through a fence or maybe even fly over a wall, I do think that they would um, typically avoid it <laughs> just because, um, yeah, most of those are shy creatures, but I'm not a biologist. <laughs> Didn't know bees were shy. All right, go ahead. <laughs> and um, is, a, is a tax break my only benefit if I donate? I mean, obviously, besides the environmental impact, mm -hmm. but is, is a tax break my only financial benefit if I'm donating part of my land or all of my land to a conservation easement? Yes. Uh, what about circumstances where the easement is sold? Oh, um, yeah. So conservation easements um, are perpetual. And so if you, um, oh, oh, you mean like the, ta I'm sorry, you mean like a tax deduction. Um, I believe that the tax deduction would pass down to the new owner, um, although I, th I believe... Um, no, I, what I was referring to oh. is if, um, let's say, the Nature Conservancy um, buys an easement on my property and I'm not donating it, they're purchasing the development rights. 
Um, so you're asking if uh, a land trust buys a piece of land that doesn't have a conservation easement on it? No, they don't buy the land. They just buy the development rights. So on a conservation easement? If they come in and pay me a, a fraction of the value of the property to place it under conservation easement so that I can no longer develop it. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so you're asking if um, that would be considered a conservation easement or like would the tax benefit pass on to the Nature Conservancy? What would the benefit be from a tax perspective if something like that happened? Is there, there's, is there a tax benefit if I sell the development rights versus donate them? Oh, um, I don't think so. I think that would, um, I think that would count as something other than a conservation easement. So, yeah, that would probably fall under something else. Does, uh, in your research, have you seen whether or not the uh, putting land under conservation easement has an effect on the price? Does it, does it greatly lower the value of my land because now someone can't develop on it? Oops. Um, yeah, has your research shown that, uh, that land value prices go down if they have easements on them? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's just because they can't develop on it. Um, so, um, buyers wouldn't want to buy it as much if they, um, couldn't develop on it. Like, if you, if they wanted to buy land so they could put a house on there and they find out they can't put a house on there, then, um, they, it would probably sell for a lot less and put out a, um, probably a smaller offer. Debbie. <coughs> So if, the, if it's devaluing the land, is the credit enough to kind of cover that for that landowner? Because if, if, if I, you know, have a $100,000 piece of property, I, get, um, I put a conservation easement on it, now it's worth $50,000 because, because I can't develop it and a future owner can't develop it. So the most I can sell it for is $50,000 mm -hmm. to the next buyer. Um, is the credit going to cover the, the devalued part? of the, the land? Um, yeah, I think that would, um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer because um, it sort of depends on the landowner's values. Um, I think that if they, if if I were them, if I, I thought really hard about um, whether I would, first of all, want to sell the land in the first place or pass it down to my um, children or something like that, um, and if I made sure that I was okay with it being devalued, I, I personally um, would be okay with that but yeah for some definitely um a tax credit wouldn't be as valuable to them as cash so uh, you mentioned that the incentive in 2015 was it only temporarily positively impacted um, people giving their land do you see a concern with this tax credit do you see that having a temporary impact also or what do you think the do you think it's enough of a benefit to to potentially last and get people more incentivized i think so um like um <laughs> i am not super well versed in the tax code and i i think most people can say the same um and so <laughs> so i think that um Something, tax deductions are really hard to understand. It took me forever to understand what they were. And so um, I think that since a tax credit is essentially, I guess, cash that you can use for your taxes um, to deduct money off of your tax liability, I think that more people would see that and be like, oh, wow, I know exactly what that means. I like that, rather than a tax deduction where they have to sit down and figure out what that means. So, yeah. So with this... Uh this tax credit, so that this is more money for, that, that, that doesn't have to be paid in taxes for the owner. Has research looked into any people on the other side of the equation saying, well, if this happens, then either the municipality or the county or even the state is now getting a significant less money, is getting significantly less money in terms of taxes, and this is gonna have some sort of effect down the line. Anything in there to say that this is going to harm small municipality budgets or count or um, uh, if that they're if they're just have less money coming in in taxes um, 
that, yeah, I haven't seen anything like that, but I do know um, that state conservation easement programs provide um, tax credits based off of usually about, um, I think it's 50% of the fair market value, um, and that can be carried carry forward from anywhere to five to 25 years. And so um, those programs, unfortunately, they don't keep records, and if they do, then those records are only available to the landowner and to the government. Um, so I wasn't able to find those and um, figure out what benefit it's doing for the, their land. But the fact that they're continuing to be funded, um, I think, means something. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I think that um, the fact that state um, conservation easement programs are continuing to do that is a good sign. All right, with that, our time is up, unfortunately. Thank you. <laughs>